May is one of the months that the church uh, dedicates to honoring the Blessed Mother. We'll call it the Merry Month of May. Greetings and God's blessing. This is Father John Carapi with another episode of Weekly Wisdom. Uh, this week we're going to begin a four-part miniseries uh, mini for the month of May. Uh, it'll be on the Blessed Mother, of course, as uh, May is one of the months that the Church uh, dedicates to honoring the Blessed Mother. We'll call it the Merry Month of May, M-A-R-Y. The Merry Month of May, a four-part series. Uh, we're doing it um, just for Weekly Wisdom subscribers. Um, uh, the first uh, talk that I'm going to do uh, today is going to be on Mary, the Mother of God, or Theotokos, in Greek, the God-bearer, uh, one of the most profound and uh, far-reaching doctrines of our faith. And then the s second and third uh, uh, presentations in this miniseries will be on the Akathist hymn of the Eastern Churches. You know, Pope John Paul the Great, John Paul II, uh, often said the church must learn to breathe with both lungs. And he was referring to both the Eastern Rite as well as the Western or Latin Rite. Now, most of us are Roman Rite or Latin Rite Catholics, but there are many, many uh, Eastern Rite Catholics, and they have, uh, uh, certainly, they're Catholic. Uh, they, they have uh, beautiful liturgy, magnificent tradition. Uh, much of the early tradition of the Church uh, came from, from the East. And uh, we're going to include, uh, as well, uh, although uh, they're uh, separated uh, now since the 10th century, really, uh, uh, the Russian Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox. They're very much like us. They have valid sacraments. They have a valid priesthood. They also have beautiful tradition. And we have much to learn from the Eastern Rite. So this Akathist hymn uh, of the Blessed Mother um, is just a, a magnificently beautiful um, prayer or hymn. And I'm going to uh, do that in two sessions. And then the final, the fourth a presentation will be on Mary, the Immaculate Conception. Uh, so to begin this little mini-series, we'll talk about Mary as Mother of God. Now, you know, that's the most beautiful, most profound title uh, with, with which we honor Our Lady, and uh, it is perfectly theologically correct. Uh, but uh, for centuries and centuries, um, uh, people have, there have been a lot of people who don't understand it, hence there has been controversy. Um, I remember once I was preaching in South America, and uh, it was on a Saturday, and I always uh, try to mention Our Lady, uh, at least in one presentation on, on Saturdays, which the church also uh, dedicates to honoring our Blessed Mother. And I was uh, preaching about the Blessed Mother, and I used the, uh, uh, the title, Mother of God. And uh, there were some uh, uh, ministers from uh, different uh, churches, Christian churches, that uh, had come to this because um, they were quite concerned. They, they had been, um, their churches had been growing, and most of the membership had come from the Catholic Church, who was falling away. So they came and sat sat down, very interested to see what I was going to uh, have to say, especially since there were over a thousand people there listening to me. And when I used that term, Mother of God, one of them jumped up and started shrieking, No, God has no mother. Uh, God has no mother. You know, and the f very boorish, for one thing, you know, bad manners, for another, and lousy theology, for another. But that is a relatively common uh, misunderstanding. And that's what it is. It's a misunderstanding of the term. So I'm going to try to talk about this. I'm going to try to uh, give you in a nutshell 
um, the church's uh, teaching on this. Um, the difficulties, as I said, the errors, mostly come from misunderstanding. Oh, there can be bad will in some cases, but it, it's, um, it, it, it's like a lot of things. You know, it, it it's, uh, can be tremendously complex, and yet it's ultimately simple. Um, the, um, you know, we know that what one thing we're not saying, and you have to be clear, um, listen to this carefully. We are not saying that uh, somehow Mary preceded God, and in the natural course of the way we think about such things, that, that Mary uh, is God, is the mother of, uh, uh, of God in a natural uh, sense, meaning from all eternity. Now, we know that Mary is a creature, and God is the creator. Uh, Mary uh, began, she, her existence started to be at a moment in time when God ordained. Um, God's existence did not begin at a moment in time. God is. Uh, he's eternal. There was never a, a, an instant where God didn't exist. Uh, I am who am uh, really uh, indicates, uh, as God said to Moses on the mountain, I am who am. God's very essence is to exist, and so uh, there, God is not pre-existed by anything. God is uh, forever. Uh, so what does it mean then when we say Mary is the mother of God, or the term that was used in the early church and still in the Eastern churches, theotokos, and the Greek word God-bearer is what it means, the God-bearer. Mary, the mother of God. Uh, let, let me just give it to you in a real nutshell. You know, one of the, when, when, the, uh, when the very upset pastor started shrieking that um, Mary's not the mother of God, I, you know, I don't usually engage hecklers uh, in conversation, but I did speak with them, and I said, don't you believe Jesus is Lord? Well, he said, of course. Well, is Jesus divine? Yes. He's the second person of the Blessed Trinity. That's number one. Jesus Christ is a divine person. The eternal word. The second person of the Blessed Trinity. His existence, like God, the Father, and Holy Spirit, forever. It's eternal. God assumed a human nature and became like one of us in everything except sin. So, God, Jesus, assumed a human nature. How did he do that? He did it through the fiat, the yes, of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the power of the Holy Spirit. So Mary conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, a divine subject of action. Now, you know, this is something we have to uh, pay attention to this. This is important. Um, you really, to understand, especially for seminarians and priests, uh, certainly for theologians, you have to understand Christian metaphysics. And, and I'm going to give you the short course right here. It's very simple. You have to understand such things as persons, natures, essence, and so forth. Uh, Jesus, the person, is divine. The subject of action is divine. He, he has only, there's only one person, a divine person. Jesus Christ is a divine person. He has two natures, divine and human. He's fully God and fully man. And so when the Blessed Virgin Mary conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, who did she conceive? Jesus. Is Jesus God? You better believe it. Is Jesus man? Absolutely. True God and true man. Mary is his mother. Simple as that. Who did she conceive? Jesus Christ. Is Jesus God? Yes. Hence, she is the mother of God. And that is something, you know, some people say, oh, I don't believe that. <laughs> you know, it's irrelevant. You know, you, you, your personal opinion is basically irrelevant. You know, now, I, you know, I, I'm talking to Catholics here. I respect everybody's religion, but I'm a Catholic priest. I preach the Catholic faith. Now, everyone is most welcome 
to listen. And I understand some people might not understand it, but don't uh, reject it on emotional grounds. If you're going to examine something like this, do it intellectually. Do it, do it intellectually and, and with the eyes of faith. So when Mary conceives, she, she conceives Jesus. Jesus, a divine person. There's only one person, and he's divine. Mothers don't give birth to natures. They give birth to persons, and this person is divine. Jesus, a divine person. So, so Mary is the mother of God. Why? Because she's the mother of Jesus Christ. And he is God. This is very, very important. Now, uh, the, the biggest controversy in the history uh, of this question came about in the 5th century. The, uh, the bishop of Constantinople, Nestorius, uh, was, was teaching that um, he was against this. He didn't believe this. No, she's not the mother of God. She just conceived the human nature that was later assumed by the divine person. Wrong heresy. And so uh, th this bishop Nestorius, uh, who's forever now known as a heretic because of his uh, position on this, he, he uh, was bishop from the year 428 to 431. Um, like many clerics, bishops, priests, theologians, in the history of the church, um, <laughs> you know, he was the source of this, of this heresy. He was not the only one who erred, but he was uh, the most notable one at that time. He held a position of power and authority in the church. Uh, he stated that Mary gave birth to Jesus Christ, a regular human being. Uh, and then uh, later, uh, the, the, this human person, now his error was he imagined two persons, one divine, one human. Not true. There's only one person, divine. Uh, later, this human being was united to uh, divinity, but, but the union of the two persons was merely accidental, Nestorius would have said. Uh, that, 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 that the divine uh, dwelt in Jesus, the human being, as, as in a temple. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, this ancient heresy uh, has been recycled many times. You know, there are no new heresies, really. There are only old heresies that keep getting recycled. And we have this uh, today in, in many ways. It, oh, I've gotten e emails and letters from people who, if I, when they hear me mention the term on television or radio, uh, they go ballistic. <clears throat> now, let me, let, me tell, let me assure you of one thing. At that term, uh, that, that, the, when we honor the Blessed Mother that way, with the title the Mother of God, or the God-bearer, Theotokos, uh, all of hell trembles with rage and with fear. That much I assure you. This spills over into the rest of creation at times, and we see then uh, rage uh, boil up in certain quarters at the very mention of the name, the Mother of, of God. The Council of Ephesus was convened in, uh, in 431 to deal with this problem, and, and the, uh, the, the bishops at Ephesus... Um, now, that was the Council of Ephesus, but we have a, a, a long-standing tradition of this uh, belief that Mary is, in fact, the mother of, of God. St. Cyril of Alexandria was the first. He refuted Nestorius, asserting uh, it was not an ordinary man who was born of the Holy Virgin, on whom afterwards the word descended. What we say is that being united with the flesh from the womb, the eternal word has undergone birth in the flesh, making this birth in the flesh his own. There, there are many great saints, fathers, doctors of the church who've spoken about this. This is nothing new. Uh, they, we didn't just d dream up the title Mother of God. It, it goes back to antiquity, to the earliest times. Um, for instance, St. Irenaeus said, The Virgin Mary, being obedient to his word, 
received from an angel the glad tidings that she would be, or that she would bear God, the God-bearer, Theotokos, meaning mother of God. Um, Hippolytus, St. Hippolytus, to all generations the prophets have uh, pictured forth the greatest subjects of contemplation and of action. Thus, too, they preached concerning the advent of God in the flesh, the incarnation. Uh, his advent by the spotless and God-bearing Theotokos, Mary. So you see Saint, uh, or, or rather Hippolytus, wrote about the Blessed Mother being the God-bearer or the Mother of God. Another holy man from the early days, Gregory the Wonder Worker. For Luke in the inspired gospel narratives delivers a testimony not only to Joseph, but also to Mary, the Mother of God. The Mother of God. It is our duty pr to present to God, like sacrifices, all the festivals and hymnal celebrations, and first of all, uh, the Feast of the Annunciation, to the Holy Mother of God, the salutation made to her by the angel, hail full of grace. Peter of Alexandria, they came to the church of the most blessed Mother of God. See? Referring to the Blessed Mother's the Blessed Mother of God. This was in the 4th century. So you see the term was used from the beginning. St. Saint Cyril and Methodius both used the term uh, Mother of God. Uh, St. Cyril of Jerusalem said, The Father bears witness from heaven to the Son. The Holy Spirit bears witness, coming down bodily in the form of a dove. The angel Gabriel bears witness, bringing the good tidings to Mary and the Virgin Mother of God also bears witness. So you have so many. Saint Athanasius, a uh, great, uh, great saint uh, from the East, by the way. Uh, the Word begotten of the Father from on high, inexpressibly, inexplicably, incomprehensibly, and eternally, is he that is born in time here below of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. God. Uh, Ambrose, St. Ambrose of Milan, the first thing which kindles ardor in learning is the greatness of the teacher. What is greater than the mother of God? And on and on it goes. And, um, you know, some of them, uh, <laughs> you know, some of the saints were, were none, none too uh, um, easy on the heretics. Either listen to St. John Cassian said, now listen here, you heretic, you who say that, that, that God was not born of the virgin, that Mary is not the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ who is God, uh, <laughs> well, you understand nothing about theology. And on and on and on. And, you know, this is the way to, uh, to study the faith, by the way, is study that you have to study the, the, this, what the saints Fathers and doctors of the church had to say, uh, this question about Mary being the mother of God and using that title, mother of God or Theotokos, God bear, uh, this goes back to antiquity. This is firmly rooted in our tradition. It is absolutely 100% theologically correct to say that Mary is the mother of God. Usually the people who, who so flippantly dismiss it or claim that, it, that it's an error, uh, <laughs> they really haven't studied the question. And uh, I don't think they have so much bad will as misunderstanding. That's what happens with a lot of things. Um, so you have to understand what the term means. The reason she's the mother of God is because she's the mother of Jesus and he's God, period, exclamation point. So the Council of Ephesus then basically asserted two things. Very important. First, the council formally asserts that Jesus is one person, divine, with two natures, divine and human, two wills, one for each nature, subsisting in the one only subject of action or person, which is divine. They're united. That na the, 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 the natures are united, as we say, hypostatic union. A very great mystery, very beautiful. That is our faith. Secondly, the Council of Ephesus affirmed that our Blessed Mother can and should rightfully be called the Mother of God. 
Uh, note that Mary is not uh, the mother of the Godhead from all eternity, but the mother of Jesus, who is God, in an application of what we call in theology the communication of idioms or the communicatio idiomatum, uh, we can do this. Uh, we can say that she gave birth to Jesus. She gave birth to the person, the divine person of Jesus Christ. Hence, uh, she's not the mother of one of his natures. She's the mother of the person. Hence, she's the mother of God. Now, our faith is a seamless garment, a strict integrity, a oneness. It is very important to note this. If you attack and uh, dis distort or destroy one element of the faith, one doctrine, one essential moral principle, then you jeopardize the entire edifice. St. Thomas Aquinas used to say, if you take one stone out of an arch, the entire arch collapses. If you shoot only one hole in the hull of a ship, the entire ship sinks to the bottom. Likewise, with the faith, you, you can't reject this. You, you, you see, if Mary's not the mother of God, then you've attacked the, the most fundamental elements of our faith, that Jesus Christ, a divine person, assumed a human nature. Then we're really in trouble, because if Mary's not the mother of God, <laughs> then Jesus didn't assume a human nature and we're not redeemed. They all fit together in a strict integrity. So the church throughout history has been assiduous, um, very zealous in defending every single element of our faith. So, so if, if you ever hear, oh, Mary's not the mother of God. How, how could God help? Know that that person is just not understanding it correctly. Most likely that's the case. Uh, or maybe they have some malice. Uh, in either case... Um, they're wrong. Mary is the mother of God, and it is perfectly correct to use that title. Now, one of the earmarks of the saints throughout the century has been their great, unfailing uh, devotion to Mary under this title uh, of mother of God. Because of this, because Mary's the mother of God, the mother of Jesus Christ, who is God, she's also, in a special way, our Mother, because Jesus, when he assumed that human nature, things changed for humanity. And you know from the cross at that most solemn moment, Jesus gave Our Lady to us uh, when he gave her to St. John. Remember, he turned to the disciple whom he loved and said, Behold your mother. St. John, as it were, was standing in proxy for every one of us. And we received at that solemn moment a spiritual mother. Uh, and, and this is so important. Uh, a lot of people today have difficulty. Uh, and I understand this. You know, many of the problems we have today are, are, the, are certainly misunderstanding, but the result of woundedness, terrible woundedness, you know, we live in a generation in history that is so beat up, so wounded from a, a variety of causes. Um, one of the, the fundamental uh, tactical uh, and strategic moves of, of the enemy of souls, the devil, uh, is to strike at the family, uh, separate families, um, where you've, you've got uh, so many people that can't relate to a mother or to a father. And it's so fundamentally important. God is our father. And you might not have good memories of a father. Many of us may not. You know, you, you may have even been abused uh, by, uh, by your father. People have been physically abused, verbally abused, sexually abused, all kinds of abuse. And people suffer. From this abuse. It, it marks them. They carry that forward then in, in the history of their life. And so they have difficulty relating to God as a father. They also have, may have the same way difficulty relating to Mary as a mother. They have a difficulty with the concept 
Now, you know, the dogma is one thing, and it's extremely important. Uh, we believe that Jesus Christ is a divine person. He assumed a human nature. We believe that Mary, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. She is the mother of God, period, exclamation point. That's what we believe. Somebody out there doesn't believe it, that's fine. You believe what you believe, but this is our faith. We believe Mary is the mother of God. That's the doctrine of the faith. But there's more to it than, 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 than doctrine. You know, uh, it, it's, it's personal experience, too. The individual, the dogma is one thing. The, the, the existential day-to-day -day experience of individual human persons, that, that's another thing. You know, St. Therese and so many of the saints spoke about Mary in such loving terms uh, as their mother. You know, many people who, who've not throughout history been privileged to have uh, the aid and comfort uh, of a good mother. Perhaps their mother uh, passed away at an early age. Perhaps she abandoned them. Whatever it was, uh, they find in the Blessed Mother a true mother. A loving mother who no matter what is going to love you. St. <laughs> um, Therese, a uh, great saint and a doctor of the church, said, I, uh, Mary is both mother and queen, but I, I find her more mother than queen. Um, I remember in the early years of my ministry, I was uh, preparing to help people make the total consecration to Jesus through Mary, the de Montfort consecration. And there was a man there who was a, uh, he had been a Protestant pastor for many, many years, a good man, solid man, he understood scripture. And um, he was struggling at the time. His, uh, his wife had passed away recently, and they had been together for quite a long time. And of course, uh, uh, he was uh, deeply afflicted because of this, you know. And uh, he, was, he came uh, to the lectures that I was giving, and um, he listened to me talk about the Blessed Mother and how uh, she brings all things to Jesus. And, and how we make a consecration to Jesus, we give everything to Jesus Christ, through the hands of Mary. Listen, her hands are cleaner than mine, and, you, and yours too, believe me. You're not immaculately conceived, and neither am I. So uh, uh, she has a special place. And I went through a 33-day um, a, a, a preparation, and, and uh, this good man sat in the front row, and uh, he listened to everything, and he asked me many, many questions. And... Um, at the end, uh, he s came up to me and said, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, it was going to be the uh, Feast of the Annunciation, he said, I want to make that consecration, you know, uh, but I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can. I, I, you know, my, my whole uh, training, my upbringing, everything, we, we don't have this tradition in my church. And I said, no, I, I understand that, and, and don't, don't feel bad if you don't. If you can't do it, you know, you, you can, I'm sure you've learned things, and that's fine. He said, well, he said, <laughs> could you explain it all to me again? And I, I'd taken 33 days to do it the first time. <laughs> I gave him a little recap, and he, and he, he smiled, he, he went home, and I didn't expect he'd be able to do it. You know, a lot of times people can't come to the truths of the faith intellectually. Some of the greatest minds ever have wrestled with these things intellectually and haven't been able to come to it. Uh, sometimes it takes, I remember a, a great journalist, Malcolm Muggeridge, um, wrestled with these things for many years, and he said, I couldn't come to it intellectually. But um, one day I saw Mother Teresa, and it just clicked, and I said, so that's what it's about. And I became Catholic. The next morning at Mass, preparing for the consecration. This good man, Brother Don, was at Mass, right in the first row. He came up. Now, not being Catholic, he didn't receive the Eucharist. He's a very respectful man. He folded his hands and he bowed, crossed his arms, indicating he wanted a blessing, which I gave him. And he made the consecration, total consecration of Jesus through Mary. And afterwards I said, Don, <laughs> How'd you come to it? How'd, uh, how'd you, you, you were able to do it? He said, yes, it's amazing. He said, last night I went home, it was late. I sat in my chair, 
I was tired. I was lonely. Missed my wife. And I was worried. I, you know, I'd listened to everything, but I just in my heart didn't feel I could do it. Then all of a sudden, mysterious peace came over me. It's like when you're at a parade and it's maybe cold outside and your mother wraps her cloak around you. It's a mysterious thing. And I knew from the inside out, with all my being, I knew I had a mother. And my mother is the mother of God. And that's the human experience. And so we have the doctrine of the faith, which we can rely on, the immutable truth. And then we have that personal touch of the mother who gave us her only son, Jesus, our Lord. Mary, the mother of God, your mother and mine. God love you. God bless you. And goodbye.